Today I'm going to be giving you a virtual tour of RF Bewley. It's one of the old wartime New Forest airfields based on the south coast of England in the county of Hampshire. Um, essentially I'm going to be giving you an intro to the airfield, a little bit of history, telling you a bit about it, showing you what's still there today um, and what used to be there and hopefully giving you some inspiration for yourself. So if you ever want to go there yourself, you know exactly where to go. So RF Bewley, it's an A-class airfield. It was opened in late 1942 um, and then closed as a military um, wartime operation in 1945 when the war ended. And then when the war ended, it remained open until I think late 1959. Um, there was a period there where it was used for testing. And I'll come on to that in a minute. But yeah, it was an A-class airfield. You can see the, the the letter A here, or what appears to be a letter A. These are the three runways. The reason um, these A-class airfields had these three runways was uh, to account for wind direction. So if the wind was blowing a particular way, they could land on one aspect. If it was blowing another way, they could land on another one of the runways. Now, all these uh, A-class airfields, they tended to follow a template. So they tended to have similar type buildings, whether that was the hangars, or the shooting ranges or the living accommodation and everything that went together into making this a wartime airfield and in fact this uh, RF Bewley um, was one of the larger ones um, it had about 2,000 members of staff there um, and they all would have uh, lived slept and eaten up in the uh, sort of accommodation quarters most of which were concentrated around this area here which is now known as Round Hill campsite. During the war itself, um, it was initially opened for use by the Royal Air Force. There were also Czech uh, bombers taking off and operating from here. And then towards the end of the war, the US uh, moved in and it was taken over by the US Air Force as well for a short period of time. So during its history, both bombers and fighters took off from here um, in the fight against the, the against the enemy if you want to access rf beauty there's there's three car parks i recommend the first one would be here which you come in you can either park here or in this area here um, this is the Bewley Heath car park it's clearly labeled as you come down here so that's that's a good place to park alternatively you can park up in here this is hawk hill enclosure and you can see the car park there it's accessed through this road there's parking here and here or alternatively you could park in what's called Stockley car park so named because of Stockley enclosure here and I'll come on to that in a while too so where you park will depend on where you go um, I recommend starting off probably down here to be honest Bewley Heath car parks as I said you can come in here and you could park in here now this is probably one of the first interesting points so if you look at the airfield from afar and I'll overlay an old 1945 map you'll start to see what look like they kind of like trees I guess um, these are what are called the airfield hard stand areas or sometimes commonly known as frying pans and it's it's easy to see why they might be called frying pans now these served a very useful purpose so if you can imagine the aircraft would have landed on the runways and then they would have used the perimeter track that we see around Bewley to navigate into the separate parking areas for the airfield uh, and those parking areas for the airplanes were these hard stand areas you see also known as the um, the frying pans now the reason all the planes weren't just parked in one place um, is an interesting one and it makes sense when you think about it because often people might think well surely all the planes would be in a hangar and this was one of the main hangar areas here and there was another hangar area down here the reason they weren't all parked in the same place was to protect against attack because for example let's say um, the Luftwaffe decided to attack this airfield if all the planes were concentrated and parked in one place it'd be a lot easier for the Luftwaffe or the enemy, whoever that might be, to destroy all the airplanes in the airfield in one go. So what that meant in terms of airfield design was that these hard stand areas were created um, and they were displaced around the airfield so that the aircraft were as far apart from each other 
as possible. Um, so that's why you see these designs. And you see these on New Forest airfields and airfields around the UK from this period um, all the time. You, you know, you can often see these telltale kind of tree frying pan, area, frying pan areas. They were called hard stand areas as well because they were made from a lot of compacted concrete and tarmac, which meant that once the aircraft were sitting on one of these pans, one of these little frying pans like here and um, they wouldn't sink into the ground and to today in 2021 while i'm making this video one of the old hard stands here which you just make out is now a car park and you can park your car in it so park your car in there jump out and start walking this way now what you see here this bit of gray uh gray tarmac here this is part of the this runway here that runs from um west to east which still actually exists and today it's used by the model flying club they've been flying airplanes here i think since the 1960s um in today's modern era of model airplanes they're all very much radio controlled but back in the 1960s when they started um doing model airplane flying here they were all i believe powered by elastic bands which would get wound up um, but someone who probably knows more about that topic uh, than I do can probably correct me. So walk down here, come around here, or you could have parked here. In fact, you can see a car there as well. And you can start to walk down this part of the perimeter track as you go. Now there's a there's, there's one particular diversion you could actually make once you get to about probably here, or you could follow some of these paths. They, they all tend to exist still. Um, but if you make your way from here, up to about here approximately let me just zoom in yeah this is it so it doesn't look like much now but this used to be uh, the battle headquarters for RAF Bewley now airfields of this type all had what was called a battle HQ um, it was a bunker that was kind of half dug into the ground half sticking out um, had a number of rooms and effectively or essentially rather its purpose was for the commanders to retreat to should the airfield come under attack so should the airfield come under attack um, a few of the movers and shakers from the airfield would come to the battle HQ and they'd be able to direct operations from that point whatever that might be whether it was the defense of the airfield you can't really make it out today but if you walk out to there and I'll overlay some video you can still actually to this day stand on top of what would have been the battle HQ or the battle headquarters um, it, at some point probably around 1960 ish it was filled in and there was an attempt to bury it as well probably by the uh, the Forestry Commission or Forestry England who are responsible for for the land in the new forest along with the New Forest District Council. Um, you'll also see this area here. You can still see some concrete foundations uh, to this day here. They're defence huts, um, so that's pro possibly where maybe arms were kept um, and handily placed near the battle headquarters should the airfield come under attack. And actually, that's another thing. I think um, what there is one instance of where a bomb was dropped at RF Bewley. Um, I don't have the information to hand. I'm just talking from memory here. But uh, overall, uh, the airfield was um, did relatively well during the war and wasn't, wasn't really put at risk other than I think there was one bombing attempt or if I'm just thinking from memory now, I'm pretty sure that Luftwaffe lit some flares over the airfield um, to signify it was going to get attacked, but the attack never came for whatever reason that might be. So then you come back down onto the perimeter track and you can, can, can continue to walk up. Now this track here is really interesting because what this is, this is the line um, to the bomb store. Now if you remember from earlier I spoke about the car parks, you could park up at um, Hawkill Enclosure here. Now Hawkill Enclosure let me just see around here. Now, bear in mind this image is now 20 years old. I don't that building's no longer there, and but you can still see some remains here and remains along this track here. Now, this was the bomb store. Um, so what would happen would be the bombs would be loaded on tractor trailers. They would come down this track, down this line here, cross this road, down this track. And um, there'll be various things that would happen here. You can still see the remnants of these slight curvature 
paths here. There'll be various huts here where I think um, that the bomb would be armed at some point because it would come out from here. And I think maybe at this point they might fuse the bomb. Um, I'm not particularly expert on, on the bomb process. Um, it's something I'm going to learn a bit more about. But effectively, that's why you see these things, because the bomb tractors could come off the pathway, hit another hut there, and there'd be something else done to the bomb, whether it was primed or fused. And then it would come off again here. Something else would happen, come down onto perimeter track. And at this point, it could then be taken off to the plane where the bomb was going to be loaded onto. So yeah, if you come up this track and cross the road, you can very clearly still see signs of the old bomb store. Now, obviously, the bomb store at RAF um, airfields like this during World War II, they were far away from the airfield itself because obviously um, having all those incendiary devices near an airfield and planes was never going to be a good idea. So I would say that's about, I think they're about maybe a kilometre away, 800 metres, can't remember exactly. So yeah, come back down again oh and actually whilst we're on the subject here if you are crossing the road take a nice uh, little look here or closer look this is the site of an old um, bronze age barrow so um bronze age barrows date from 2000 bc to 1000 bc i believe um they're bronze age burial grounds uh, or burial mounds rather and the earth would be dug up and the people would be buried under the earth or in the earth and then the earth would be piled up on top so as you go through the new forest you'll often see uh, these mounds I think that one's there you'll often see it from the road um, and there used to be one there now this one's called Colt Pixies Cave um, 500 years ago or so um, the new forest commoners would think that pixies would roam the new forest causing mischief and luring their horses and cattle into the boggy marshes and um, never to be seen again and obviously we know today there are no such thing as pixies but this was probably one of the areas where they thought they used to hang out so this is called colt or sometimes cold pixies cave it used to be a barrow very much with that mound appearance to it but when the uh, ministry of defense or the defense ministry can't remember the exact term when they said they were going to take over this piece of heathland in early 1940s to make it into an airfield there were plenty of uh, Bronze Age burial grounds and barrows on this land uh, but they had to destroy them because obviously you cannot have big mounds on an airfield it doesn't make for a good landing experience so this one over here um, you can see it's been dug out which is why it has a very um, ununiform appearance to it now interestingly enough um, the the Ministry of Defence or the Air Ministry um, apologies if I'm getting my terminology wrong what they did do they gave archaeologists a little bit of lead time so the archaeologists could come and excavate any Bronze Age burial grounds or barrows tumuli that they could find to excavate for anything that was there of archaeological interest before they then got flattened um, so the airfield could be made so that's why that has a strange appearance when you look at it up close they did actually find a bracelet in there I believe so just uh, something to look out for when you come to the airfield. So if you come back down this track, which leads from the bomb store up here, you can continue on this way and start walking down to here. Now this is where um, there's a lot of history actually. So this would have been ha the hangar. It was a T2 type hangar for the airfield. Um, and probably, I'm imagining at this point, I don't know for sure, I'd have to probably check it, but planes would come there for repairs maybe, and it would be used for storage. Also what you would have here are various huts. You can still see some of the pathway configuration here. This point here is where the uh, the control tower or the watch tower for the airfield would be. And as you can see, if you zoom out, it offers views across the entire airfield. So that's something to look out for. When you do come down here, um, before you kind of hop over there into the hangar, take a walk down here and eventually you'll be stood on where the, uh, the old watchtower used to be and you can just see that square configuration there and then if you come down here they'll use, there was a path there there's like a concrete it's almost like a patio structure um, which is still very evident and then if you scroll in you can just about make out a B and an L now that was the pundit code for this airfield what pundit codes were they were two letter uh, codes um, which would help the airfields be identified from each other. So if you think about it, during World War II, there were 12 airfields in the New Forest alone. They all had a pundit code. Now, obviously, depending on the weather conditions and the experiences of the pilot, especially the US guys who are coming here for the first time, they might not have known the local landscape as well as 
the British guys. Um, so the pundit codes were very useful for all pilots in reality because what it did, it gave them a visual indicator from the air as to which airfield they were approaching. So if they saw a B and an L there, they'd know they were at Bewley. So that's something to look out for. It's still there to this day um, and it's made out of sort of a concrete cement. Something else that you'll also find there, and I think it's about here, just behind this concrete sort of patch platformy type area, you'll find the signals mortar. Now what that would do, um, and that was controlled by the uh, by the watchtower or control tower here. The signals mortar was used for when the weather conditions were really bad. So let's say there was a lot of cloud cover, the pilots couldn't see the BL, they didn't really know where they were. In order to orientate them so they knew where to land, someone in the control tower here would probably pull a cord um, and that would set off a mortar um, that would fly up through the cloud cover and explode with a flash of, uh, flash of light. And that would tell the pilots that they were above RF Bewley and they could land correctly. Back to the pundit code though, so this pundit code BL. Interestingly enough, by uh, at the end of the war, um, the pundit code for Bewley was actually changed to BQ. Um, so what you will see if you ever examine aerial photos uh, from the era for sort of 1945 and onwards, you won't see the BL and that's because um, they actually covered it up because the airfield was now um, labelled as BQ. So during wartime a lot of the airfields um, they did tend to change the pundit codes because there's so many airfields are built they probably started running out of pundit codes to use. Um, so yeah BQ was what this airfield was known as post-war. Another interesting aspect also about this uh, particular era is the fact that post-war sort of 1945 onwards um, this was where a lot of testing happened. So the airfield was taken over at the end of the war by the um, Air Force Experimental Establishment or the AFEE. They were a, a group that was set up to test things and the, what they would test here would be parachute drops. Um, they would also test out things, uh, new technologies such as, such as helicopters. So a classic example is a film I, I developed recently. It was kind of my attempt at a documentary on my YouTube channel was about a German helicopter that was actually captured by the Allies and flew over the English Channel. It was the first ever helicopter to cross the English Channel and um, that was called the FA223 Dracker and it flew from I think somewhere around here in France, dropped over at Dover and then made the way all the way to RF Bewley to be tested. Um, so the AFEE who were working there towards the end of the war and then the post-war years, were able to literally strip out all the secret technology from the Luftwaffe's uh, FA223 Draca helicopter. Now, this is where a lot of the helicopter testing would happen. Um, and there's photos that I'll overlay of helicopter development happening at RF Beauty post-war. Um, but the Draca in particular, that German helicopter that was captured, um, it was actually captured not just the helicopter, but also um, the uh, German pilot and two engineers. They ended up working with the RF Beauty AFEE personnel to test the helicopter but within two weeks of arriving at Bewley they actually crashed it somewhere around here and legend has it it's still somewhere buried on Bewley Heath although I would take that with a pinch of salt but if you want to know more um, check out my video and uh, you can find out a little bit more about that it's a fascinating story so if we continue on to come down this way let's continue down the perimeter track um, other interesting aspects particularly when okay actually here's here, yeah here's a here's an interesting aspect if we dive in a little bit deep here you'll see two circles one's man-made in fact sorry let me correct myself both are man-made but one's more modern than the other so this is another one of those bronze age burial grounds um i think it's called it's it's, a, it's another barrow and um, it has a ditch around it that fills with water when it's wet but yeah again it's another bronze age barrow but what you see here is more of a kind of a dartboard appearance. So this is a bombing target. Um, this was used by both the RAF and the US Air Force to practice bombing, probably in the lead up to D-Day, in the case of the uh, the US Air Force at least. Um, it's, it's one, two, three concentric rings made from chalk. If you walk out there today, you can still occasionally make out the chalk. Um, it's actually better on a wet day because when it is a wet day these concentric rings tend to fill with water making it a lot easier to see the practice bombing target. I believe that's probably because the chalk um, doesn't let the water soak through as quickly as the rest of the heathland does. They used to drop things like um, smoke bombs on there and baker-like bombs that would shatter on impact. Um, essentially that was just so they could try and practice hitting the middle of the spot. So 
yeah, it's an interesting aspect of the airfield that not many people know about. Um, it's not that easy to make out on modern day satellite imagery. But once you've got your boots on the ground there, you might be lucky enough to still see some chalk. And actually, whilst we're on the subject, if you are exploring this airfield, please don't ever dig or disturb the ground. Um, you'd be breaking various laws if you were to. So um, yeah, just a, an ethical note there not to uh, not to break any rules. So if we come around this side of the perimeter track again, we'll see some more of those hard standing areas and come down lower and lower and lower. And actually there's some more interesting aspects down here. So, oh yes, so this track here, this actually leads to what would have been an old um, shooting range for probably small arms fire. I believe it would have been a 25 yard uh, range so the airmen or the people responsible for guarding the airfield would have walked down to here there was a building approximately here that they could sit in or stand in rather and then shoot their machine guns and small arms at sort of a brick placement here um, which had sand sort of piled into it to slow down the rate of the bullets into the brick wall um, so yeah that's an old shooting range there and then there's some pond here as well there was another um, hangar here too which was also used post-war by the AFEE. Um, if we continue to come down, I recommend walking down this track here. If you walk down this track and make your way here, um, it's hard to make out from an aerial shot, but this is actually a, a, a hill aspect. And you can see these walking tracks that are coming up and down it from all directions. So what this is, um, this was called the shooting in butt. Now what would happen would be, um, it was uh, created with earth that had been dug out from here which develops into a pond in wet weather but the earth and gravel was dug out to create this large mound also known as a shooting in butt so what would happen would be um, the airplanes would come into they'd probably taxi into this hard stand here and from this point they could test their machine guns by firing the machine guns into the mound and there was probably targets in the mound as well now uh, that mound um, was useful in many ways because it stopped any bullets from the aircraft flying over and potentially hitting anyone in the village of Pili there. So next time you see that, it's not um, it's not a natural phenomenon. Phenomenon can't say that word. It's it's a man-made hill, and often you can see it from the road as you drive down your Newcastle car. So that's the the shooting in butt there. Another aspect I recommend you walk down are the runways themselves. Now the best way. I recommend to do this is to access via the, uh, the model flying club now don't worry you've got every right to walk along this uh, existing piece of runway so you can typically walk park up either here or here make your way down the runway and choose a direction to take now as you walk down the runway you'll see some very interesting aspects still remaining so you'll see tarmac pathways on the edge of the runways and I always imagine that the airmen would have been walking down those uh, those pathways at some point. You would also see things such as um, old drainage systems, um, where the lights would have been and so on. And actually I often prefer walking down the runways because you start to see a little bit more of the wildlife. Um, it's starting to reclaim Beaulieu or you'll bump into a lot of horses um, doing their thing out there. You'll also see trees growing out of the runways as well. You will also start to see a lot of the brick as well. Um, there's a lot of brickwork still left where the airfield was demolished um, and that brings me on to another interesting topic so the airfield itself uh, was built using commercial companies um, so companies such as Molem's construction would have helped with building the airfield or companies like Wimpy they would also build World War II airfields and um, in fact sometimes when you do see a solitary brick somewhere on Bewley airfield I mean, it can give you pause to thought because um, a lot of the, the the perimeter tracks and the walkways around Beaulieu Airfield were actually built up using bricks that they bought from brought along from Southampton. When Southampton was bombed during the war, during the Blitz, there was obviously a lot of brick work that was broken up. It was brought here on trucks and they used it to build uh, or to create the roads and then tarmac over the roads and the pathways on the airfield. So if you ever see a brick, it could have actually come from Southampton during the Blitz and might have a story behind it. Um, and then when they uh, ended up dismantling the airfield in 1960 onwards, a lot of the bricks were then taken back to Southampton and other places in Hampshire to help reconstruct um, Britain and um, help with housing development and so forth. So a lot of recycling went on. 
So that's the majority of the airfield aspect covered with exception just one last part. If we go back up to this hangar area here, uh, when you visit, you'll probably see uh, mounds of compost. What those are, um, it's bracken that's being composted there. Um, from what I understand, um, I think the Forestry Commission, they collect bracken from the new forest because it can be a little bit uh, intrusive or, or get a bit too much in certain areas. They bring it here and they compost it into huge mounds and they leave them in this hangar here to compost down. And I think they then sell it to garden centres. So if you're buying compost from garden centres, it could be bracken from the new forest that's been stored at RF Beauty. Um, I believe they also store these um, other airfields around the new forest as well. So occasionally if you see these big brown hills, that um, they're great to for kids to climb up or in fact my son loves climbing to the top of them that's what it is it's composted bracken but what we're going to do now is make our way to um we're going to make our way over to round hill which was the main communal areas um just a very quick detour first so if you remember earlier i spoke about hawkle enclosure where you can park if you park up in hawkle enclosure you could actually walk to Rounds Hill, and if you do, it gives you the perfect opportunity to find a very, very interesting site. So, park up in Hawk Hill, or walk up from here. You know, you choose whichever direction you want to take. But if you do park in Hawk Hill, uh, park here. There's a gate around here, and that lets you walk through this here, which gets you to Stockley Enclosure. Now, this is the bend that eventually takes you to Brockenhurst from Bewley. But just in this area, this wooded area here, it's called the defense site. And there's probably the foundations for, I can't, for the top of my head, maybe 20 Nissan huts. Nissan huts are those um, those wartime huts that were kind of uh, have that semicircular curved shape. But you'll see the concrete foundations in there um, with other things. And it was the defense area. So um, historically, I think with wartime airfields, the defense area is where the men who are responsible for defending the airfield would be. I'm not sure if that was always its purpose, but my estimations would be based on how many people could be accommodated in Nissan huts. So there was probably around 200 airmen um, in this site at any one time. And it's important as well to say it was airmen, not the air women, because the air women, and actually that reminds me of something I've missed out, the air women were based down here. So the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, this was their area, where they were um, during wartime uh, the women they, they didn't pilot the planes but they would uh, do other functions around the airfield whether that was loading bombs um, and other tasks and around here this is where they would be and actually interesting enough just uh, behind these trees here there's still two air raid shelters they're Stanton air raid shelters Stanton air raid shelters were built by a company called the Stanton Ironworks Company based in Derbyshire um, and they built these air raid shelters to be used on airfields they were easy to construct and they probably could have been carried there by a group of the airmen and then quickly put together um, in order to provide some coverage if the airfield was to come under attack so yeah you're still able to see two of those air, uh, air raid shelters in this area and to get to it you walk from round hill and you follow a pathway down here now what's important to uh, recognize at this point is this lush green area here and all this area here which i'm just circling with my uh, with my mouse this is private farmland and the air raid shelters that are here they are the other side of the fence on the private air um, uh, on the private land so please don't um, jump over the fence or walk through the gate to get some because they are on private land but you can admire them from from the fence um, and interesting enough as well they're, they're they're two structures one of the only two structures that still remain from the RF Beaulieu site and the reason being is probably because they are on private land because when the 1960 date came uh, along and the forest forestry commission or forestry England took back control of RF um, Beaulieu all the buildings here started to be dismantled but obviously um, when this land was given back to the farmer the landowner they decided that they weren't going to dismantle those uh, air raid shelters so you can still see them it makes for an interesting thing to see so let's now do a little explore of uh, round hill which is the communal area so depending on which way you come you can walk down here and the first point you'll hit when you get to round hill campsite which is now used as a campsite for the public is uh, the water tower here now this water tower this was 
I would hold water to serve obviously the 2,000 people I mentioned earlier that lived and worked at RF Bewley. And when you see the water tower, you notice it looks very shiny. Now there's a good reason for that because 10 or 15 years ago, 250,000 pounds was spent on replacing the actual tank aspect. So whilst the, the, the struts and the legs that the water tower sits on are still from the wartime era, the tank itself has been replaced and actually still serves the campsite and I believe some of the surrounding um, residential areas, whether that's the houses that are still here. So that water tower, it's a stunning thing to see um, and it's it has a fence around it. This uh, line that goes up here, this was another communal aspect um, as well. In fact, the whole entire campsite was full of Nissan huts. Um, and other type areas for example there was a cinema here a gym this area here um, you can just about make out some foundations still that was the grocery store for the airfield um, that went on uh, post-war to become uh, a, uh, a scout hut so um, what was it called can't remember from the top of my head now it will come back to me later but it was a scout hut but unfortunately that was dismantled as well in the 1980s because it had a couple of arson attacks on it um, and the scouts decided, I believe from what I've been told, to invest all their money at the Fernie Crofts um, aspect, which is a little bit further to the north in the New Forest. So, yeah, the scouts stopped having this area um, in the 1980s. But that was a building that was still here for recent times. This here is another uh, Bronze Age barrow. It's called the Pudding Bowl Barrow. Um, obviously, it wasn't on the airstrip, so it, it, was, uh, it remained in place. So you can still see that. That's fenced off as well. Um, if we start to let's go this way so if you walk down this path around hill and then you veer off to the left um, you get to this place here now what you'll see when you get here you'll see a couple of gates uh, if you're looking at them straight on from the path you'll see a gate on the left and a gate on the right now what you're allowed to do because it's a public bridleway you're allowed to go through the gate on the left as you go through the gate on the left you end up sort of veering this way and what you will see here is two examples of handcraft huts um, they were like nissan huts but they were made from asbestos on brick instead um, they were deemed to be of a bit of a higher quality sort of accommodation area than a than a nissan hut would be um, and actually this was a sergeant and officers quarters around here and this whole area here where these cottages are um, there was uh, there was the the sewage um, sort of treatment areas for the entire airfield because obviously you imagine there was two thousand people there it needed it but there was also other stuff there was canteens there was even a squash court here um, as well as a gym and another shop I think so there was lots of activity in these woods and this is called Perrywood enclosure if you walk through Perrywood it's very quiet and you will start to see uh, little signs of what might have been here once with bricks in the ground and occasionally you might see a drainage cover on the ground so interesting stuff but yeah you can walk just here and you will see some huts that are now being used by farmers to hold livestock in. so there's a couple of examples there and then around this area as well there's some more now believe it or not this part um, the, the, some of the handcraft huts there people still actually live in them to this day um, they've been converted into living accommodation but I, I can't stress enough all this land here and here as I said uh, is private so whilst you can walk down this track and continue sort of I think going this way along a broader path either side of that bright path it is all private and people do live there so please if you do go down there please respect that fact and do not trespass um, because you would want someone coming in your garden would you so yeah there you go so that's that aspect here if we come back up to round hill you've got round pond here this is the entrance to round hill campsite up here which comes off the main brockenhurst road this area here um, currently there's some tree felling going on there at the moment but during wartime this was um, I think site number six or was it site number five no I think it's site number six there was a mortuary um, which um, a sad fact of life there were a number of crashes at RF Beauty so a mortuary would have been needed on an airfield of this size there was an ambulance garage as well so you can um, a, a lot of sad stories I'm sure would have happened there but uh, conversely um, there was also this pond and, and I like to think that the airmen and women probably uh, take a little bit of R&R &R and sit by the pond there as well. What's also interesting is that post-war, um, this area 
and these areas down here they're actually commandeered by the council um, if you can imagine after the war there was a housing shortage for a number of reasons obviously houses have been bombed um, which meant men were coming back from war with no houses or homes to go to but also there was obviously a lack of money um, for for development of housing so what happened um, post-war for i think up to maybe could have been even up to 1955 maybe even longer um, a lot of the nissan huts around here were turned into accommodation by the council um, and so yeah they, the people lived down here and they also lived up in area this area and I think probably around this area too so yeah there was a lot of civilian life going on and if you visit my website which is my ode to this airfield refbeauty.co.uk I've been lucky enough to chat to uh, many people who actually lived on the airfield um, as adults and the children and I've managed to capture some of their stories and it makes for absolutely fascinating reading and I think that's probably a good time to stop so I hope you've enjoyed this uh, virtual tour of RF Bewley and it inspires you to get out and interact a little bit more with our history thank you <laughs>